that he can take care of one is. Wow. This feels great. <laughs> Woo! This feels good. Let's all stand. I've got the words in front of me. Y'all got the words in front of you. Let's all sing together because he lives. Thank you for those that are joining us by live stream tonight. 
We're thankful that you're with us as well. Look forward to having your group in in the very near future. There may be an opportunity or possibility we can combine some of the groups and give you a couple more opportunities to worship. Uh, but we need to go through everything a, a couple times just to be able to see who's here, who's coming, who's going to show up, and make sure we don't overload our sanctuary and uh, keep us from the social distancing and things that need to be there. But doesn't it feel good to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. Well, I tell you what, it's a blessing already to be here. It is always special whenever we can get together inside the house of God. I'm thankful that God allowed us to open the doors back up. Amen. And I'm so thankful. And I'm also want to, I just want to say thank, uh, thanks to um, some groups that have been working hard to be able to get us here. And I want to say thank you to the medical team for them helping. I surrounded myself with the best people I possibly could to be able to get our doors open. And so let's give our medical team a big hand. Thank you, guys. Also, we, uh, we want to say thank you to the security team. Let's give them a big hand. for sure them. And also for our lovely usher team that we have put together. Let's give them a big hand. Thank you. They're the ones that made sure you were socially distanced tonight so we didn't get in trouble. Amen. Thank you guys for being here. We're going to go ahead and open up in prayer, and then we're going to turn it back over to CJ and let him sing. If you would, grab the Bibles. We're going to be in the book of Ezra tonight, and uh, looking at Ezra chapter 6. So if you'll find Ezra, and we'll go ahead and pray while you're finding that. Father, we are so thankful, Lord, to be able to be in your house tonight. And Father, I'm thankful, Lord, that you allowed us to be able to get to this point where we could open, open our doors back up again. I'm thankful, Lord God, for the chance to be able to worship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And Father, we know that we have to divide these groups up at this point, but we're thankful to have this group with us tonight. We're looking forward to having the other groups with us in the near future. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the chance to hear from you tonight. And Lord, we ask for your blessings upon our service. We ask for your blessings on those that are present, on those, Lord God, that are joining us by live stream tonight. We ask, God, that you would touch each and every heart. Give them exactly what they need, Lord, on this night. Father, we need you desperately in these last days to minister to us through your word. Father, we are so thankful we have a book tonight that has all the answers in it. And, Father, we pray, God, that you'll speak to our hearts through it. We ask for your blessings on CJ as he sings tonight, that you would place your hand and your touch and your anointing upon him. And, Father, we pray, God, that there will be no interference or hindrance from Satan in any way. Protect this group here tonight. Protect, Lord God, our live stream as well. And, Lord, protect my heart, my mind, that I may not be attacked or confused or confounded. But, Lord God, there will be liberty to worship you tonight. There will be power with the preaching and the singing. And people would leave out of here saying it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. And those by live stream would receive a tremendous blessing as well. And we'll ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. amen.
God that was able to reach down uh, to where I was at whenever I couldn't reach up to where he was at. Amen. And I thank God he came to me. I'll tell you this tonight. Uh, this is weird. I've been preaching for weeks now to an empty building, basically, and this is really weird, but I'm glad it's weird tonight. Amen. Uh, some of, some of y'all brought the weird with you. I, I mean, I'm just looking who's here, but uh, some of y'all brought the weird with you tonight. But anyway, no, we're thankful. We're thankful to be able to be here tonight. Ezra chapter 6. Uh, we're going to get into the Word of God tonight. We've been looking out of the book of Ezra. Um, and some things we need to know as we're coming back into the house of God. The same thing was going on in the days of Ezra. And uh, we're going to look tonight in Ezra chapter 6 and verse 9 to start with. And I'm going to back up two chapters. And I'm going to walk you through uh, chapter 4 and chapter 5. If you'll notice, I skipped over uh, two chapters. There's a reason for that. And I'll explain more about that here in just a moment. We're going to back up to chapter 4 here in just a moment. And look at that first verse in chapter 4. Then come to chapter 5, look at the first verse there, and then back over to chapter 6 tonight. So if you would, Ezra chapter 6, and we're going to look at verse 9. And I'm going to say something right now I've not said in, I think, eight weeks. Stand to your feet for the reading of God's Word. Amen. The Bible says in Ezra chapter 6 and verse 9, And that which they have need of, both young bullocks and rams, and lambs for the burnt offerings of the God of heaven, wheat, salt, wine, and oil, according to the appointment of the priests which are at Jerusalem. Let it be given them, notice this phrase, day by day without fail. I want to preach tonight for a few moments on the daily needs of a discouraged people. Let's be seated. We'll pray together. Father, we're thankful once again. We cannot thank you enough for allowing us to gather in your house tonight. I thank you for all the teams that work so hard to make this happen. I thank you, Lord, for allowing us to open our doors. And I thank you for this group that's here, being able to see my brothers and sisters in Christ tonight face to face once again. And Father, we need you to bless us, Lord, through the preaching of your word. So I'm asking God tonight you would empty me of all of me that there is and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Take this vessel and speak through me. And I pray, God, for those that are joining us by live stream, that they would have open hearts and minds to receive the message tonight, and those that are here as well. And Father, we'll give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, tonight, the reason that I have skipped from uh, Ezra chapter 4 over to chapter 6 is because chapter 4, 5, and 6 uh, basically form a chain of thoughts that are linked together that deal with one particular subject. And I want to be able to relay that to you just by simply reading the first verse of chapter 4 and chapter 5 and then coming back over to chapter 6 so that you can see exactly what the thought process is. So go with me back over to chapter 4 and look at verse 1. And let me explain the context here. As we were over in chapter 3, the last time that I preached out of the book of Ezra, we talked about the right way to return. And we talked about how the people of God were preparing to come back into Jerusalem and come back to the place of the house of God. Literally, the situation we are in tonight, and we're in last week, leading up to this point. And so now they have come back to Jerusalem. Ezra has led them up. They are now up on the Temple Mount, and they're beginning to come back to the place of worship and beginning to come back to a place where they could rebuild the house of God. And then notice here in chapter 4, verse 1, what happens as soon as they do that. The Bible says here in verse 1, Now when the adversaries, isn't it just like the devil, as soon as God's people get ready to come back to the house of God and get ready to worship God and get ready to begin to build up what Satan has tore down, the adversaries will be rising up to stand in our way. And we know the devil will begin to raise up adversaries to try to stop what God is wanting to start on this very night. I want you to know something. If you want to write over chapter 4 a title, I want you to write this, The Devil Hates Church. The Devil Hates Church. I want you to know that Satan has been laughing and living it up over the last several months when we have not been able to come into the house of God. He despises church. And I will tell you this, he has enjoyed the attacks that have been levied upon the people of God and been, been put out against the church of God. And, and I want you to know he despises what we're doing tonight. 
The devil hates church. Now come over to chapter 5. <clears throat> well, actually, let me just say this. Whenever he rose the adversaries up, because you need to know this, there was an end result of the adversaries pushing back against God's people as they were trying to worship. In Ezra chapter 4, verse 24, the Bible says, Then ceased the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. So in other words, when they came back up there ready to worship, they came back to the place of worship like you, you, you have tonight. The adversaries rose up and they began to work against God's people. And because of that, they got God's people to stop worshiping God. Now we come to chapter 5. Look at verse 1 and notice what God did. <clears throat> then the prophets Haggai, the prophet and Zechariah, the son of Edo, prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, even unto them. Now this is the same Haggai that wrote the book of Haggai and the same Zechariah that wrote the book of Zechariah. And both of those books are the sermons recorded that are mentioned right here. When they stood up to preach to the people of God after they quit coming because of the adversaries and their attacks, those books hold the very sermons that were preached to the people of God. And the result of those sermons in verse 2, then rose up Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josadak, and began to build the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, and with them were the prophets of God helping them. So when they began to preach what is found in those two Old Testament books, it stirred the heart of the people up once again. And even though they had quit on God because of the adversaries and their attacks, they began to get revived once again. And they began to stand back up and come back up to the house of God and begin to worship once again. But let me explain something to you. The devil never quits. He never stops working against the people of God. So look down here at verse 3. And notice at the end, the adversaries rose up again and said, Who hath commanded you to build this house and to make up this wall? So here you can see the pattern now. They begin to come up and worship. The adversaries rise up. They get them to quit. And then the preacher comes up and preaches and gets them stirred up. And then the adversaries rise up. And they try to get them to quit again. And so it goes. As we get closer to God, the devil will get closer to you and I and begin to push back and try to stop us from doing what we're doing. But I want you to understand something. We've got a God bigger than that. Amen. And we come now over to chapter 6 and look at verse 9. The people of God now have fought battle after battle. They're down, they're defeated, they're discouraged, and they are disheartened. And we find now that God rises up a king by the name of Darius. And God gets that king up into that place of power so that he can do two things for the people of God. Number one, he will stop their enemies. Look in verse 7 if you would. The Bible says, this is, this is what Darius said, Let the work of this house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews build this house of God in his place. So God rose up this great and mighty King Darius who was a friend to the people of God. He was basically like the president of the United States, if you would. And so he rises up this man that has a heart for the people of God. And he tells those people that were working against God's people, you need to leave them alone. You need to allow them to come to the house of God. Let me say something tonight. That is my prayer that God will raise up some people way high up in the administration that will say that's enough of attacking the people of God. And that's enough of trying to shut down the house of God. And he'll stand for what God wants him to stand for. Amen. Then he had him do another thing. And I like this part too. By the way, this is not a stimulus check that is here, but it's something near it. He rose him up to supply the needs of the people of God. Look down here in verse 9. And that which they have need of. And at the end it says, let it be given them day by day without fail. Yeah. Do you know what happened whenever they saw 
that they had a friend? Do you know what happened when they saw that somebody was standing up for them as they come up to the house of God and was going to stop their enemies and supply their needs. And by the way, God rose this man up so ultimately the blessings that came from him actually came from God. I'm talking about the same God that said, I will supply all your needs according to my riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Hey, listen, God can supply our needs. He can stop our enemies in a number of ways. Hey, I don't care how he does I'm just looking for him to do it because I am tired of being trodden over by people that hate my God and hate the word of God and despise the people of God. And I'm looking for God to raise somebody up. And when he did, it encouraged the people. It encouraged the people of God. Daily needs were given to them. For the discouraged people that were there. Now I want to cover these because they all stand for something that you and I need every day of our life. Number one, let's look down here in verse 9. And notice this. That which they have need of. Now notice what he says first. Both young bullocks and rams and lambs for the burnt offerings of the God of heaven. Now whenever you look at that, each one of those is a picture in type of the redeeming power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you remember what John said in John chapter 1 and verse 29? Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. And so whenever he mentions these, they were, these were sacrifices for the sins of the people. And every one of them in some way points to the Lord Jesus Christ. So number one on our list of needs that will help us is there is a need for conversion. And I want you to know tonight, I understand that probably everybody in this room is born again tonight. Maybe not everybody by live stream, but everybody in this room is born again tonight. But I want you to understand that this world right now is filled up with people that are discouraged and defeated and down and depressed. And some of them are even taking their own lives. And let me explain to you why that is. Because some of them have a burden on them that they cannot get lifted off on their own. And listen, that burden is where they're going to spend eternity. And let me tell you something tonight. What this world needs when they're burning down and discouraged and depressed and defeated. They don't need another pill. They don't need a psychologist. They need a savior that can lift them up out of the pit of sin. Yeah. of their life. They need conversion more than anything tonight. There was a man who was a Hindu. And this man had, had done some terrible things. And his heart was burning down with the guilt of his sin. And this Hindu man went to one of the gurus. I don't worry, I'm still socially distanced from you right now. I have a limit on my spit right now. I cannot go any more than six feet. But, but I want you to know that, that this man went to one of the, the Hindu gurus and, and, and he said, I am so burdened down by my sin. My heart is breaking. I don't know if I can go on. What do I do about the guilt that is on me from the sins that I have committed? And that man said, you need to do something. And it is very simple. You need to go down to the Ganges River and you need to dip yourself in the Ganges River, that sacred river of the Hindu people. And our Hindu gods will wash away all your sin through the Ganges River. So this man began his journey and he lived about 20 miles from the Ganges River. And so he began to take that walk down those dirt, rough, rocky roads to try to get to that river. But as he walked along, the guilt of sin was so heavy on him he said I'm not worthy to even walk. So he began to crawl on his hands and on his knees. He crawled over those rocky roads until he got down to the Ganges River and when he got there his hands were bloody his knees were bloody, the tops of his feet were bloody and he got down and he crawled into that river and he got down under it and he stayed there as long as he possibly could and when he could not stand it any longer he came up out of the water and began to crawl up on the shore and he waited for his Hindu gods to lift the burden of sin and the guilt of sin off of him. But as he laid there, he realized the guilt of sin was still there and the burden of sin was still there and he was heartbroken and he wept like a little baby. But while he was weeping, off in the distance 
was on the shore of that river, somewhere way down that river, he could hear somebody yelling, hey, listen, you don't need this river. What you need is the redeeming blood of Jesus Christ. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that lifts away and washes away your sin. He listened to that man for a little while, and finally he got back up on his hands and knees, and he began to crawl towards that voice. He got to where that man was at, and he said, is it true that this Jesus can wash away my sin and take away my kill? And that man said this, he said, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, will wash all of your sin away. And that man looked up, and with a trembling finger, he said, that's what I need, that's what I need. And the man got born again and saved by the grace of God. When he got saved, he looked up and said, the guilt is gone, the sin is gone. Hey, let me tell you tonight, what you need more than anything is the converting power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank God tonight, there is a need for conversion, and it can be met. Number two, we need to be content tonight. Now watch this. Look at verse 9. The Bible says, after he mentions these sacrifices, the next word is weep. That deals with contentment. You say, how in the world does that deal with contentment? Let me show you. Go with me to Psalm 147. Now, if you can't keep up, that's okay. Psalm 147. Just write it down, verse 14. I'm going to show you. Psalm 147, verse 14. Wheat stands for contentment. We need conversion, but we need contentment if we're discouraged. The Bible says this in Psalm 147, 14. He says, He maketh peace in, my, in thy borders and filleth thee with the finest of wheat. In other words, you're content when you're filled. Are you not? You ever get filled up? You just eat a big old meal and everything, you get filled up and everything is just fine. Isn't it? I mean, you're like a puppy, your belly sticking out like this right here. You just kind of cross them fingers right over that thing, just about like that. You lay back in that recliner if you've got one, and if you don't, you need to get you one. And you lay back in that recliner, and I mean, it is all good. Amen. Amen. Hey, let me tell you, when you get filled up with the things of God, it will make you content. But the problem with this world is this. They're not content. Right. And they're discouraged because they're not content. You will never find a discontented person that is not discouraged. You understand that? Because nothing will ever satisfy them. You've got to be content with the things that God has given you. Do you understand that the people that are the happiest are not the ones that are living in the big mansions and they're not the ones that are driving the fanciest cars and they're not the ones that have millions in their bank accounts. They're not the ones that have everything this world has to offer. Some of the happiest people I've ever met in my life, hey, they were in foreign countries and had nothing more than a little house with a dirt floor in it, but they had God in their life and they were just fine and they were content. They were not discouraged. Hey, Americans are the ones that are discouraged tonight. None of the people in Bolivia or Nicaragua and places like that. They're content with what God's given them. Amen. And if you want to stop being discouraged, you need to be content. Be content with what God's given you. Not content necessarily with who you are per se, if you've got sin in your life, but what God has given you. I, I, I was reading a great story this past week. And it's a story, it reminds me of a lot of Christians. There was a, a bull, and this bull was bought. And he was put in a pasture. And this pasture was beautiful. It had the best grass. I mean, it was high and green. It had the freshest water in it. But better than that, it had three beautiful cows in it. I'm talking about the prettiest cows you've ever seen in your life. And when they dropped that bull off out of that chute, he walked over and looked at them cows, and his eyes got about that big around there wasn't no other bull in that pasture but that bull. And he had all three of them cows and he had all that grass and that fresh water. Man, he had it made. And he was walking around and he was in high cotton, as they say. And he was having the time of his life. He had the best of anything you could ever imagine. 
But one day he was walking by the fence that separated his pasture from another pasture. And as he was walking by, out of the corner of his eye, he caught a vision of something way far off on the other side of that pasture, near the fence on the other side. And as he gazed and looked through that fence on the other side, he saw three other cows that were beautiful on the other side of the other pasture. And he stood there and stared for what seemed like hours, looking through that fence, Watching those cows on the other side. His cows were back here and they were coming up and nudging him. He didn't want nothing to do with them. He didn't look back at them. He just kept looking at the cows on the other side of the, of the pasture, on the other side of that fence. This went on for several days and finally he said, you know what? Those cows over on that side are better than the cows that I've got on this side. So he backed up and he looked at that fence and he looked up and down and measured that thing out. He backed up. He got a good running start going and he left to try to leap over that fence. And as he did, he did not quite get high enough. And that barbed wire ran down underneath his belly and scratched him all up. And his back feet hooked him and it flipped him in over end. Now he made it over the fence, but he flipped in over end and got all scut up. He jumped up and looked around to make sure that nobody else was watching. And them other cows were just laughing at him. I mean, they were just laughing at him. And he didn't care, though, because he had his eyes on three other cows that were on the other side of that pasture. Man, he took off a running as fast as he could, and when he got over there to where they were at, he slid right up to them, and he said, what's up? <laughs> but to his horror, he realized they were not cows at all. They were bulls just like him. Hey, let me tell you something tonight. You better be careful what you're asking for and what you're looking for and be content with what God has given you. You might just get what you're wanting and one day find out that it wasn't what you wanted at all. That what you wanted was on the other side of the fence where you started out at. Hey, listen, God has given you all you need tonight. Amen. You need to be content. Number three, I find the next thing is salt. And that is our need for a covenant. That is our need for a covenant. So we have a need for conversion. We have a need for contentment. But we also have a need for a covenant. Go with me to 2 Chronicles real quick. Just go to the left. You'll be right there in it. 2 Chronicles chapter 13. I want you to see what verse 5 says. 2 Chronicles 13 verse 5. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 13 and verse 5, if you've got a Schofield Bible, page 502. <clears throat> the Bible says, Ought ye not to know that the Lord God of Israel gave the kingdom over to Israel to David forever, even to him and to his sons, by a covenant of salt. See that? So it stands for a covenant. Do you know what a covenant is? A covenant is an agreement between two people. Now here's what you need every day of your life you need to make a covenant with God. And you need to agree. There needs to be an agreement between you and God that you're going to do two things every day of your life. Number one, that you're going to lean on the Savior. That you're going to lean on the Savior. Do you realize that when we try to do it ourselves, it never works right, does it? You ever try to do things on your own and make an absolute mess out of it? Listen, if you'll make a covenant to lean on the Lord, to seek His face every day of your life, by the way, to lean on God, you've got to be in the Word of God. You've got to be in prayer to God. You've got to be faithful to God. It's not rocket science, but it's there and you need to do it. Lean on the Lord God. Don't lean on your own understanding, but lean on God. Lean on the Savior. The great missionary to China, Robert Morrison, when he was getting ready to go to China, a man asked him, and said this, said, do you expect to do great things in the Chinese empire? And he said, no, but I expect my God to. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. That's a man that was leaning on God. And you've got to realize tonight, you need to make a covenant. I'm going to quit doing it my way and I'm going to do it God's way. Lean on the Savior. Number two, you need to also make a covenant to look into the Scriptures. To look into the Scriptures. Do you realize that we're living in a day and an age where people have all but abandoned the Word of God? Do you know that the other day somebody messaged through Facebook and, and this just absolutely made my heart uh, almost burst. I thought this was the greatest thing. But somebody messaged through Facebook and it was not a person that goes to this church. Matter of fact, I don't know that they're even in this state to be honest with you, but I can't remember exactly. But they said this. 
They said, I want to let you know that um, basically, to, to make a long story short, they fell back in love with the Word of God. And their very words were, I have dusted off my Bible. And I have gotten back in the Word of God. Man, I was about to have myself a spell. I will tell you this. Hey, listen, there is no greater thing you'll ever do than to get in this book and stay in this book. Hey, listen, this book is what you need more than anything in these last days. Listen, you don't have to read 10 chapters a day, but you need to get in it every day of your life and get some of it in your heart and your life. Yes. You need to look into this book. The answers are here. This is a living book. Let me tell you what Martin Luther said. Martin Luther said this. I wrote it down in my Bible. He said, I have made a covenant with my God that He send me neither visions, nor dreams, nor even angels. I am well satisfied with the gift of the Holy Scriptures which give me abundant instructions and all that I need to know both for this life and for the life which is to come. We need to make a covenant with our God. A daily covenant to lean on the Savior and look in the Scriptures. <laughs> Number four, if you'll go back to Ezra. We find here there's a need for conversion. There's a need for contentment. There's a need for a covenant. But number four, there is a need for courage. Notice the next in the list after salt is wine. It's wine. Wine is a, is a picture type of the courage that we need. How do we know that? Well, when we go over to 2 Samuel, we're going to turn there tonight for time's sake. In 2 Samuel chapter 16, verse 2, there was a man that brought to David's soldiers, his mighty men that were there fighting in the wilderness. He brought to them some wine. That wasn't the alcoholic wine. It was what the Bible calls new wine. Brought it to them, and he said it was for such as be faint in the wilderness. In other words, they had lost their courage. In other words, they had lost their drive. They had lost their desire. They had lost everything that they needed to keep on fighting that good fight that was to be fought there. And he said, I brought this to revive these men. And I want you to know tonight, you need a revival of courage in your life. We've got people today, Christians today, that have been beaten on by the devil for so long, they have laid down. They're like that cat that used to be in that room where all those rocking chairs were at. And every time the grandkids would come in, they'd sit in the rocking chairs and they would rock on that cat's tail. And every time, it didn't matter where he went, one of them would be in a rocking chair and rock on his tail. So he got to where when the grandkids came over, that he just went ahead and stuck his tail out so he could get it over with. And some of y'all just like that. You have been beaten down by the devil so many times, you just lay down and say, have at it. And you've lost your courage. You've lost your fight. We need to get that fight back and get the good fight of faith back in our life. Listen, if you will keep on fighting even when you don't feel like it, there is a God that will honor that and bless that and give you the courage you need even when you don't think you can take another step or fight another fight. There's a God that can help you and keep you going. Amen. You need that courage. And if you'll look to God, He'll give it to you. There was a man by the name of Edward Bach. Edward Bach was a young, aspiring journalist. And Edward Bach was also a born-again Christian. And so that kept him from getting a lot of the jobs that these other journalists would get because they were willing to hobnob and do the kind of dirty things, and he was not. But lo and behold, whenever uh, President Rutherford B. Hayes was in office, this man got an invitation to the White House. This was his golden opportunity. This was his chance to make it big. And he went to the White House and he was there to cover a dinner that was being given at the White House. <clears throat> so he went in. He had his notepad and he was making notes the whole time. And after they ate their meal, then President Hayes got up and he was getting ready to make a speech. But in that day, he had a basically a tradition that at any of these meals that he had, he would have everybody pour a glass of the finest wine you could find. And he would give a toast and they would all drink that glass of wine and then he would fill the questions and the, and the things that these people had. Well, they put the glass before Edward Bach and he did not drink because he was a born-again Christian. And so that when the waiter come out and pour that glass of wine, he said, Sir, I'm sorry, I don't drink. And he said, if you could just take the glass from me. I don't want to drink, drink the wine. I apologize, but I just I can't do that. When he looked up, he saw President Hayes looking directly at him. He saw it all. 
And he said to himself, he said, I will never again get any kind of an assignment in journalism. I am done. Whatever it was over with, he had took down as many notes as he could, but he needed some clarification. And he walked up to President Hayes and he said, President, he said, Mr. President, can I please clarify a few of your statements? And he said, yes, but I need to ask you a question first. He said, I noticed you did not drink my wine. I want to know why you did not drink my finest wine. And in his mind, he thought, well, here it is. I'm done. I'm going to be blacklisted. And he said, well, Mr. President, he said, I'm a born-again Christian. He said, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. He said, I've not drank, alcohol since that, uh, drank a drop of alcohol since that day. He said, I, I just, it is against what I believe. I just don't drink. And he waited. You know what President Hayes said? President Hayes said, follow me. He walked back to the Oval Office. And he said, I want you to sit down with just me and you now. And he gave him a personal interview. He was so impressed by this man's courage that he would not waver from his convictions. He gave him a personal interview. And it put Edward Bach on the map. Do you know that man went on to win a Pulitzer Prize? Do you see how God reward, rewards courage? See, God don't care nothing about people that bend the rules or compromise or bow down to the world. Who He has His eye on are the people that are willing to stand up no matter what the cost are. And we need a daily dose of courage. And lastly, we find this. Not only a daily conversion. We don't need to be saved every day, but if people are not saved, that conversion is available to them every day of their life if they'll just accept Christ. Number two, we need contentment. Number three, we need a covenant. Number four, we need courage. And number five, we need consecration. Now look at the last in the list here is oil in Ezra chapter 6 verse 9. It talks about wine and oil. Now we don't have time to turn here tonight, but in Exodus 29 it talks about how oil was used in the tabernacle. And the number one thing on the list was this. It was used to anoint Aaron and his sons to go into the tabernacle. And whenever they did that, the Bible says specifically in verse uh, Ezra chapter, I mean uh, Exodus chapter 29 verse 7, it says specifically that Aaron was consecrated by that oil. In other words, he was set apart as holy. Do you realize that every day of your life you need to set yourself apart for God? Paul said, I die daily. And we need to die out to ourselves and set ourselves apart as holy. Now, let me tell you what holy don't mean. Holy does not mean you act like you're better than everybody else. That's right. Right. Amen. Holy does not mean that you look down your nose on people that don't live the way you live. Holy does not mean that you are something awesome. Holy just simply means this. Lord, you can have me. Amen. Do with me what you will. Are you going to be sinless? No. Are you going to make mistakes? Yes, you will. If you don't think you will, try for a while. Amen. You're going to mess up. You're going to make mistakes. Things are going to happen. But if you get up every day of your life and say, God... I want you to have all of me that you can have. You know what God's going to do? He's going to take you up on that. Amen. Because He wants all of you that He can have. And He'll take you up on that. And when you consecrate yourself to the Lord, that connects you to the next thing that deals with oil. And that oil was to give light inside of that tabernacle. Okay? So whenever you consecrate yourself, it's going to put you in fellowship with the Savior. In other words, whenever the priest went in and the, the menorah was burning, that lamp, it was burning off of oil. And it was to stay lit all the time. And it provided light in there. And that light provided a, a way to get through the Holy of Holies to where God was at. And so you will have fellowship with the Savior if you set yourself apart. Number two, you will be filled with the Spirit if you set yourself apart. Now, you've got to understand that oil is a picture of the type of the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, in Hebrews 1 9, it said that Jesus was anointed above his fellows with the uh, oil of gladness. And so it is a picture of the type of the Holy Spirit. So when you set yourself apart, you'll have fellowship with the Savior, but you'll be filled up with the Spirit. You know what happens when you get filled with the Spirit? Popping out all over you is going to be the fruit of the Spirit. You're going to bloom, and you're going to grow fruit. And that fruit is going to
going to be love, joy, peace, long-suffering, meekness, temperance, faith. Again, such there is no law. When you get filled with the Spirit, you're going to have the fruit of the Spirit. And God knows we need some fruit of the Spirit today. Amen. I'm tired of grumpy people. I'm tired of complaining people. I'm tired of angry people. Angry people make me angry, and that's good for nobody. Amen. We need the fruit of the Spirit in our life. And then number three, when you set yourself apart, you're consecrated, there's going to be fire in the sanctuary. There's going to be fire in the sanctuary. I, I want you to look at what happened over in Ezra chapter 6 and look at uh, verse 16. The Bible says in verse 16, And the children of Israel, the priests and the Levites, and the rest of the children of the captivity kept the dedication of this house of God with what? Joy. Boy, they were having themselves a spare. I feel like we're doing that tonight. We're having the dedication of the house of God all over again. Amen. It's like when we came in here in 2007 and we marched down from the old church and came in. It's got the same feel here tonight. Because we're coming back into the house of God again. And I want you to know something. We're here tonight. I feel like there's a lot of joy in this room. I think we're pretty excited about God again. And I believe it's because people have been setting themselves apart with God. They've been taking advantage of the time they've got. And I'm thankful for that tonight. Now I want you to know, whenever you set yourself apart, there's going to be fire in the sanctuary. There'll be no dead services whenever you're set apart for God. Right? There's going to be excitement. And, and you know what? There's been some great things come out of COVID-19. I believe that with all my heart. It's been aggravating, but I believe there has been some great things. Uh, Romans 8, 28 labels slapped all the way across it. And I believe we're going to see the fruit of that as people come into the house of God. Now, CJ, if you would, I, I want you to sing that song. And Dakota, you come up and play for him as well. I want you to sing that song that you sang, the second one, He Came to Me. And tonight, we can't really get down around the altar. Some of the folks on the front probably could, using social distance, and the rest of you guys can use your seat. we got six foot between each one of these pews. you got plenty of room. You can turn around and kneel down at your seat if there's no room here at the altar. Uh, and, and just use your seat as an altar tonight. But I, I want us just to get along with God tonight. And I, I want to just extend a hand out to those as CJ begins to play. Extend a hand out to those in live stream. And I want you, if you are not saved tonight, right where you're at, to bow your head while these are getting down and praying here around their seats and around the altar. I want you to bow your head wherever you're at. And if you're not saved tonight, you're without Christ. You're ready to turn from your sin and turn to the only one who can save you, and that is Jesus Christ. Maybe you would like to pray something like this with me tonight and accept Christ as your Lord and Savior as you turn from your sin and turn to the Savior. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I need to be saved. And Jesus, I know you died for my sins. You arose again on the third day. And Jesus, I'm asking you and you alone to save my soul from hell. Jesus, be my Savior. In Jesus' name. While these are praying, and those of you who are praying through live stream, and CJ begins to say, you do business with God.
Looking forward to worshiping the rest of y'all as well. And we hope to see you very, very soon. There's a chance again we may be able to combine some of the groups together. Uh, we just have to kind of wait and see who we've got and uh, go through it a time and then figure out how many are coming in, how many visitors are coming in, and uh, we can work all of that out. But we appreciate each and every one of you. Thank God for you, getting, you guys being here tonight. We're going to dismiss in prayer, and then I'm going to let my ushers come down while we're praying and get ready to dismiss the groups. And if you guys would just pay good, good close attention to them. Let's pray. Father... We're so thankful, Lord, for being here tonight. We're thankful, Lord, to be able to worship together. There is nothing and no substitute for being in the house of God with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we're so thankful you allowed us just a taste of that glory once again. And Father, we pray, God, that this would continue to build. I pray that every one of the three groups and the three services as we're having them would fill up and that visitors would realize they're going to come out, they're going to be safe, and healthy and welcome here and our members would come and feel the same way and that Lord we begin to see people saved inside of our services once again I believe you've got a lot of people's attention God and we want to see you move in our hearts and in our lives Father we pray God that you'll keep us safe and watch over and protect us keep us healthy and continue to hasten the day where we can all get together at one time in the house of the Lord we give you thanks for the praise in Jesus name Amen, Amen.